Turn with me today to 1 Peter, chapter 3. And we're going to read again from the verse 8. Remember, it's dealing with the subject of submission. And then it's moving on to deal with the <coughs> spirit of submission. So not only what we're to do, but the way we're to do it. And of course, verse 8 has to do with submitting to one another in the context of Christian fellowship. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, <coughs> but countrywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil <coughs> and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him ensue evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. His ears are open under their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you, if ye be followers of that which is good? But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. Be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which some time were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure were unto even baptism does also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Amen. We know that God will stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scriptures. Now, my text this morning is taken from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, and my subject today is knowing and listening to the voice of conscience. Now the subject of conscience is an important and fascinating one in the Bible. It's a subject that's relevant to every individual, not only here in the congregation this morning, but throughout the whole of the world. It's a subject that I believe demands the closest possible attention, a subject, of course, that can't be denied, uh, shouldn't be dismissed and set to the one side easily, because it's a subject that impacts greatly on your own soul. Uh, someone has labelled conscience as one of the world's greatest preachers. Now, last Lord's Day, we started to look at this subject under the heading the design of conscience. When we talk about conscience, what do we mean? I told you the word conscience is mentioned 30 times in the New Testament. I told you it means to uh, know together with or to with to know being the literal meaning. I informed you that every person has a conscience that it's a faculty God built into every human being to convey a sense of right and wrong. Literally, it's part of our human makeup. 
It's been given to us by God to teach us and to tell us what is right and what is wrong. It's the inner witness of rightness and wrongness of our personal conduct. See, let's remember as human beings, we are moral creatures. And we have an inbuilt sense of what is right and wrong. Human beings, of course, are different from the animals. Animals do not have a conscience. While they may have instinct, they don't have a conscience. A dog or a cat or a cow cannot and does not have a sense of guilt. They have no sense of right and wrong conduct. They have no guilt. They have no peace or contentment having done the right thing. And as we have said, every individual has a conscience. And you have your own conscience this morning. John 8 and 9, remember the story of the woman taken in adultery? The accusers wanted her to be stoned to death according to the law. They brought the woman to Christ in the temple. And he said, let him that is without sin cast the first stone. And then he wrote in the ground. And it says in verse 9, And when they heard it, being convicted of their own conscience. Every person has a conscience. In 2 Corinthians 4 and 2, the Apostle Paul lived his life as a preacher. And he said to the Corinthians, Commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So every one of us has a conscience. You have your own conscience, an inbuilt witness, a monitor that teaches and tells you what is right and wrong according to the law of God. And here's another thing that we talked about last Lord's Day. Um, every man's conscience acknowledges, accepts, testifies, points to the law of God as the highest standard of what is right and wrong. In Romans 2.15 even people who claim to have never heard of the Ten Commandments don't know anything about the law of God. They have got the law written in their heart. In other words, um, the conscience is God's monitor in the soul. And the conscience, as God's monitor in the soul, raises its voice to accuse or excuse the individual in the light of the law, when we break and disobey the law of God, we feel bad and guilty. You've got the voice of condemnation ringing in your head. When we, by the grace of God, having been born again of the Spirit and washed in the blood of Christ, strive to keep and embrace God's law, we have got the voice of commendation. We, there's a feel-good factor kicks in. Now let's get the picture. Conscience is a wonderful faculty. It was built and designed by God. Secondly, it's a moral compass for the soul. It tells us what is right and what is wrong conduct in the light of God's law. And thirdly, it's a witnessing faculty because conscience has a voice. Condemnation on the one hand, commendation on the other. It's the voice of God. It's God coming as lawgiver and lawmaker and thundering in our ears and in our soul. In his book, Pilgrim's Progress, uh, John Bunyan, uh, he called conscience Mr. Recorder. Because the conscience has a wonderful habit of recalling and remembering things that you thought were long since forgotten. In other words, Mr. Recorder records everything, every thought, every word, and every date. And Mr. Recorder can say, you said that. You did that. And on that basis, we, we can either feel guilty or feel glad. Maybe if I could illustrate it for the children this way. <clears throat> Think of your computer. Those of you who have computers. 
And you could be writing a letter, you could be working on a document, you'd be about to store a file somewhere, and all of a sudden you hit the wrong button and it's gone. And you think, oh, I've lost that forever. What am I going to do? You have to start all over again. Well, of course, for those who are very um, technological as far as computers is concerned, they know that that information that you fear is lost can be retrieved. It's not really lost. It's still there. Yes, it's dormant. You can't see it. But it can be found. And if you had an expert like Mark Strong, he can come along and he can get anything out of the computer that you feel that is lost. Now here's the thought that we left you with last Lord's Day. You and I have a conscience. Inbuilt by God as the moral compass for our soul. The conscience knows there's a lawgiver. The conscience knows that the law of God has to be reckoned with. The conscience knows all about breaking God's law. And your conscience and mine cannot be totally destroyed. And your conscience and mine can recall past events and past things. Things that could be hidden and then come up to hammer us and come up to trouble us. Even in hell, a guilty conscience forms part of one's eternal punishment. Now let's move on if we can, because here was the second point of last week's sermon. The description of the conscience. Now, if you look at the text, verse 16 If you have your Bible open, you'll see the words, having a good conscience. I'll put it in context in a moment. Having a good conscience. And then come to verse 21. And again, you've got the reference, a good conscience toward God. Now, let me ask the question, what is a good conscience? If the Bible mentions having a good conscience, that's what Peter suggested to the people in his day who were suffering great persecution, physically and verbally, who were being falsely accused of their um, conduct. What is a good conscience? I believe, of course, if you look very closely at the text, there's a link between good conscience And good conduct. Notice what he says. He starts the text with a good conscience. And ends the text in verse 16. Good conversation in Christ. The word conversation. Hasn't just to do with our talk. It has to do with our walk as well. Um, It's really to do with our manner of living. To do with our lifestyle. You see the way a man walks on earth in the context of the home, society, and the church, is affected by what's within that man. For what's within manifests itself without. Let me suggest to you this morning, in thinking of the description of the good conscience, a good conscience knows it's pricked by sin. You see, once the conscience is awakened by God, that conscience, having been awakened through the instrumentality of God's Spirit and God's Word, is filled with a sense of sin, a a sense of shame, a, a, a sense of guilt. Every sinner's conscience outside of Christ will deliver to him or her a guilty verdict. There will be an inner witness of one's own guilt. And sin before God. Your conscience. Once enlightened. Will be enlightened to its own inherent sinfulness first and foremost. And the dominant thought that will be uppermost in one's mind. Is I have sinned against God. I have broken his law. I deserve hell and damnation for my sin. Remember in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost. He was preaching about people who had crucified Christ. What a terrible sin it was to be involved in the murder of the Son of God. And as he was preaching the word of God and presenting Christ and the Spirit of God was at work, it says 
They were pricked in their heart. And the word heart is another word for conscience. In other words, there was conviction of their sin. That their conscience was pricked by sin. They knew they had done wrong. In other words, their conscience was awakened. Their conscience was now troubled by the power of the word of God and the spirit of God. And the people realized we are guilty of this sin, of being involved in the crucifying of the Son of God. And what was their cry? What shall we do? And of course they heard the call to repent and believe the gospel. And I have to ask this morning, have you ever felt the pangs and pull of awakened conscience? Has your conscience been enlightened? Has your conscience been pricked by sin? Where where you've been brought to the place where you know that you're a sinner and that you need to be saved and you know that that you need Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour? Have you come to the Saviour? Have you cried out, Lord, save me, I perish? God, be merciful to me, the sinner. See, let's make no mistake. Conscience in fallen man is misled by a darkened, unenlightened mind. The conscience on fallen man always errs on the side of caution. It always wants to be lenient when it comes to sin, when it comes to God, when it comes to God's law. The conscience in fallen man will tell itself, it's okay to do this or that. Even when it's not okay, To do this or that. You see, the unbeliever's conscience outside of Christ is fallen, corrupt, darkened, unenlightened because of sin. And therefore he is naturally rebellious to God in the gospel. So what does he do? He tries to stifle and silence and sear his conscience. He protests. He tells himself, I'm not doing anything wrong. He tells himself, well, I've got my own standard to live by. Of course, there's an attempt there, even saying that, to pull down God's holy standard. The protest is, well, I'll determine what is right and wrong. And of course, as 1 Timothy 4 and 2, which mentions conscience, another of those 30 references, talks about a seared conscience. That is, seared with a hot iron. And if someone has a seared conscience, now listen to me carefully, they have no conviction about sin in their life. They have no compulsion about sin in their life. They feel no condemnation of sin in their life. They deal with the things of God in a vile, unholy manner. They they mock the things of God. And that individual, of course, is in a complete state of delusion. And what does he need? His conscience needs to be awakened. And here's the great message. God can awaken it. And when God does... That guilty conscience is pricked by sin. And he knows that that conscience is a powerful voice. And it's testifying against him. Testifying to him. That conscience calls for acknowledgement of guilt. And a turning to God. And even then, that, that awakened individual can try to silence and stifle his conscience he can try to deaden it isn't it interesting that first timothy 4 and 2 is in the context of the last days a seared conscience how many today in northern ireland live with no reference to god jesus christ sin salvation their soul live in willful ignorance to the word of god Despite the goodness of God to them materially and giving health and strength and giving the gift of breath and, and all the rest of his blessing. And, and they don't acknowledge that. They live to justify their actions. As I've said, they've got their own standard. They live to blame others. But I was born this way. I blame their circumstance, their situation. They, they excuse, well, well, I couldn't help it. Or, or say, but it isn't wrong. See, this is the type of a conscience that fallen natural man has. He hasn't got a good conscience. He is an evil conscience. He is a dead conscience. And he will fill his mind with other things. 
He'll even tell himself there's no God, there's no obligation to that God. Yet to have a good conscience. And that's what Peter is dealing with here. It's first of all pricked by sin. And I'm asking the question, has that been true of you, having a good conscience? Notice something else very quickly and secondly here. A good conscience is purged from sin. Turn over there to the book of Hebrews. And I want to just read these couple of references. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. Right now, find a place in your Bible. Hebrews chapter 9. You're, you're better seeing the words on the page for yourself. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. If you follow with me. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Here's another of those 30 references, and it mentions conscience. And this time it talks about purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The guilty conscience that's evil and dead can be made into a good conscience. And this can only be when that conscience is not only pricked by sin, but purged from sin. And what can purge the conscience? The answer is the blood of Christ. And we can find peace through the person and work of Christ. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 verse 2. It says, For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. Keep that thought in mind and come right down to verse 22. It says, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having your hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and your bodies washed with pure water. Now here's a great truth, a very important truth, and I want you to grasp it, taking these three verses together. Once the guilty conscience has been awakened and pricked about sin and the blood of Christ is applied to purge that conscience we discover that the blood of Christ is truly atoning because once the conscience is purged the heart to which the blood is applied has no more conscience of sins in other words the guilt of sin is removed from it forever. And that individual is now not afraid to meet God face to face. That um, individual now recognizes the value and virtue of the precious blood. And it's on this ground that we draw near. On this ground we venture to have fellowship with God. And notice... It's purged from dead works. Don't we live in a day when men and women try to do things to please God? I'll go up the road and I'll join the Free Presbyterian Church. I, I'll become clean and good living. I, I'll accept a bit of morality. I, I'll even start reading the Bible and try to learn it. I, I'll spend some time in prayer. I'll study the Shorter Catechism and the Westminster Confession of Faith. And you see, those things that I've mentioned, many people try to do this. And what they try to do is they, 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 they press these things onto their conscience. And they try to satisfy their conscience. But it won't work. Because the only thing that can purge the conscience from dead works is the purging blood of Christ. It's only the blood that purges our conscience. It's only the blood that puts away our sins. 
It's only the blood that purges us from dead works. See, let's remember that there's nothing that you and I can do to please God. God has been pleased with the life and the death of his son. And that's why we're called to trust him and to faith in his merits, faith in the righteous life of Christ put to our account. The good conscience that's purged from sin rejoices, realizes, recognizes the value of the atoning blood of Christ. And let me just ask, is it the merit of Jesus Christ, the ground of your merit before God? Is Jesus Christ your righteousness? Has the blood been applied? Are you truly standing by faith upon him? You see, what will happen when the devil resurrects your sin? And the devil will bring it to mind and say, you did this in the past. You did that. You said this. I was thinking of the hymn. I couldn't find it in our hymn book. Uh, Samuel Grandi. Uh, he, he was uh, a, a vicar in um, Kingston upon Thames, I, I believe, outside London, uh, somewhere between 1780 and 1851. And remember, he wrote the words of the hymn What though the accuser roar of ills that I have done, I know them well and thousands more. Jehovah. Findeth none. In other words, when God looks for on me, he doesn't see my sin. He sees the Savior's blood. And uh, Samuel Grandy went on to write, Sin, Satan, death, press near to harass and to appall. Let but my risen Lord appear. Backward they go and fall. Isn't that lovely? Does not that tie into what David said? Blessed is the man. To whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guide. Sin has been carried away. Sin has been covered over by the blood. Sin has been cancelled out. Um, in the book of Numbers, when Balaam tried to curse the people of God, it says in Numbers 23 that God beheld not iniquity in Israel. In other words, they were a justified people. They were under the blood. It's not that Israel was without sin, but when God beheld them, there was no more remembrance of sin. And of course, when the devil tries to resurrect your sins, then you point him to the blood. You tell the devil you're under the blood. Tell the devil your sins are gone. Tell the devil you're a justified soul. Tell the devil you've got a good conscience. Very quickly, a good conscience is at peace. You see, you can be at peace even in the full light of the holiness of God and in the full glare and application spiritually of the law of God. You can know and experience true and real peace. You can have inner contentment. You can have joy. You can be at rest. You can live your life in the full glare of the holiness of God. Do you know why? Because your conscience has been renewed. It's been cleansed. Oh, oh yes, it, it's been made sensitive to God. It, it's been sharpened, but it now operates in accord with the scriptures. It lives to adorn the gospel. It refuses to live in disobedience to God. So a good conscience is pricked by sin. A good conscience has been purged from sin. A good conscience is at peace in relation to sin. A good conscience is power over sin. Now look again at our text. There's a link between the good conscience and the good conversation. The conscience approves the rightness of one's conduct. Remember what I said? What a man does is affected by what's within. If the heart is right, then he will live right. Right believing results in right living. There's a link between doctrine and duty. And it's here in Peter. And the two go together. You can't have all doctrine and no duty. And you can't have duty without doctrine. The conscience that's pricked and purged and at peace approves of holiness. It disapproves of unholiness. 
the conscience that adorns the gospel. The conscience adores all that's found in Christ in all of his fullness. In Acts 23 verse 1, in another reference, Paul said that he lived in all good conscience before God and men. He didn't live as a hypocrite. You see, the gospel of Christ deals with our conscience, but it also deals with our conduct. The gospel of Christ deals with both our conscience and our manner of living. Paul talked about a conscience void of offence in Acts 24 verse 16. Here's the context as we wrap this up this morning. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart was his command. Stand without apology and give an answer for the reason of the hope that is in you. Stand confidently in that ground. And have a good conscience. What does that mean? It means a conscience that's been pricked by sin. A conscience purged by sin. A conscience at peace from sin. And a conscience with power over sin. You see, what you say about the gospel. Should be the very experience and expression of your own soul. Whenever he mentioned, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you your reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, they were to stand without a sp- apology and give a, a spiritual answer. They were to give a scriptural answer. They were to give a sound answer because they were to do it having a good conscience. That's a conscience that doesn't accuse. In other words, the gospel affects your life. Maybe I could just finish with this. What does the gospel say about you and me? Does it speak about purity of life as well as lip? Do we live to adorn the gospel by the infallible standard and teaching of the word of God? So much so that we've got a personal experience of the power of God in our life. And we're not really concerned about externals. Although there has to be a, 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 an external concern. A, and while we take on board the examples of good and godly men, even those good and godly men are, are, are not infallible guides. We're judging ourselves by the very gospel we prove, profess. Let your conversation be, Paul says, as it becometh the gospel. Is my conduct. Becoming the gospel. My walk and my talk. Doesn't exalt Christ. We live in a strange day don't we? Many profess to be Christians. Claim to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Talk about him as Lord and Saviour. And yet sadly those who name the name of Christ. Are experimenting with drug use. You'll find them down in the pub taking a few pints. You'll find them in a dance floor, nightclub. You might even find them guilty of practicing homosexuality and and other immoral acts. And of course the Bible says, let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Why? Because the, the gospel that we profess has to be lived out. And if Jesus saves from sin, then he has to save us from a life of sin. Does it adorn the gospel? Any lifestyle choice that I make? Is my profession and presentation of Christ, does it become the good news that I claim to proclaim? That's the description of the conscience. Now I had one other thought and I'll just leave it with you. And that is the defense of the conscience. Because the context here is of a suffering people who have lost much for Jesus Christ. And they are verbally and physically being abused. And how could they live? Well, the answer is this, that the gospel guarantees them power to live. Because notice the words, in Christ. 
that is they live in Christ. They can have a life of power and victory that's attainable by virtue of union with Christ. Even though they're weak and buffeted by the devil, even though they want to quit and walk away, they can live in Christ and they can live by the grace and strength of Christ. How can we pray? How can we deny our body? How can we sacrifice? How can we study the book? It's only possible in Christ. It's only possible by the grace of Christ. A life of holiness, a life of victory, a life of adorning the gospel. Um, we could take on board what has the gospel done for you as far as your soul is concerned. And here's Paul's answer in Galatians 2 and 20. Remember he told us that very important statement that should be riveted in all our minds in many respects. He said this, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what Paul or Peter was getting at when he mentioned having a good conscience. The gospel in Christ, by the grace and power of Christ, gives us victory to live, even when we're suffering. And suffering in the will of God, we can we can have grace to bear with it. And we can have a clear conscience because of being in union with Christ. May the Lord bless these few words.